Up next, for your listening and viewing pleasure, one Steve Bussey. Steve's a software architect turned startup founder. He's the author of Real Time Phoenix, which came from his work leading development on real time Elixir applications that power critical features of business software. And he's currently writing Elixir for Rubius. Steve is passionate about sharing Elixir because of the positive impact it has on his designs and development applications. Everybody give a round of applause for Steve. Thank you, Brett. Hey, everyone. So happy to be here today. And uh, I'm going to talk about risk, which is sort of interesting after uh, Ben's talk earlier. I'll actually I'll do a little quote for him in there. So hi, I'm Steve. Uh, what Brett said and uh, just want to highlight, so I'm actually writing from Ruby to Elixir. We just changed the title, and that should be out later this year, so I'm pretty excited about that. Targeted more at beginners, and especially people coming from Ruby. So very excited about that. So what I want to talk about today is risk. And I actually had a different idea for this talk, and I'll sort of pivot into it at the end. But as I started thinking about it, really the talk was about risk. And... Avadne Wu's recent Codebeam talk, I really like this quote from her, it said, systems building, like all other endeavors, can be viewed through the lens of risk management. And I really believe that. I think software engineering is all about risk. It's about managing risk, and it shows up in the code that we write, and the features that we're building, the way that users interact with it, all of those things, it's all risk management. And uh, Ben Wheat, 45 minutes ago, said it's okay to ship bad code. <laughs> and so we'll talk a little bit about that at the end and talk about uh, shipping risky code and doing things that might be a little risky. So risk decisions, like I said, happen basically continually while you're coding. Is this line of code going to crash? Is there gonna be, are there going to be performan performance issues? Are we going to be able to ship this release on time for what the company needs? And eventually, when that line of code does break, what's going to happen? And I think it's natural to want to minimize risk. When we minimize risk, we can be more confident in our systems. You know, problems won't compound as much if we're thinking about that continually. And it feels good to find that safe path when you finally figure out all the different risk scenarios, and you're like, all right, I'm, I'm confident in this code. I feel great about that. So I think that's a natural response to, to dealing with risk. And I, I've seen that software communities overall tend to gravitate towards reducing risk. So when people are asking questions, we already sort of have a best approach to how to answer that. And 98% you know, of the time, that's going to be the right response. It's going to be a low risk answer to the question. And we're sharing learned experiences that way. You know. Someone comes in and say, hey, I want to do X. And we say, oh, you may, may not want to do X. This is what I've seen in the past when I did that. And it was risky, and maybe that's something that you want to reconsider. So you'll see that in, I think, pretty much every software community, including Elixir. And risk is also contextual. So depends on timing, requirements, tolerance, lots of stuff. And there's no silver bullet here. So if you're talking to someone and you give them a, 10 minute blurb about your problem, they're, you, they, they can't contextualize all that risk. It's really something that you hold as the engineer working on a problem. You get that context and you get to make those decisions. And this isn't a diss on Rails at all, but like the Rails way to me is about risk reduction because 98% of the time, those community agreed standards, the Rails way, is going to work for people that are building software applications. And you can build billion dollar companies on the Rails way. I mean, that's what we did at SalesLoft, and that works great. And those standards reduce your risk as an engineer because they've been proven by lots of companies that have used them. But they, they also reduce maintainer risk because as a maintainer who sort of has a, a, a the, the right way to use your library, you know that people are not going to hit as many bugs or edge cases because they're following into that path. And so these are, these are good things. But at the same time, sometimes you need to do things that are risky. You can't always play it safe. And I'd say that innovation and doing things that are innovative naturally requires risk. Because when you push the boundary, there's always inherent risk there. You're spending time, you're spending money, just all these different resources to do something new, there's risk there. 
And this is something that we deal with en as engineers all the time where we have constraints put on us sort of by the business, right? Our team is a certain size. There's a, a certain amount of time that we can really devote to solving a problem before we need to ship a product. Really, it boils down to money at the end of the day. As you know, if you have infinite money, you could de-risk everything, but it really doesn't work that way. So we have to take risks. So then the question that I was thinking about is how can we add risk in a safe way that uh, you know injects injects some risk into the process? And I think there's two things that I would focus on for this. The first is you do want to minimize risk, but you also want to manage risk that does exist and that pops up over time. So I think this is something that as engineers, everyone should practice identifying risk. Because like I said, everything carries some level of risk. Every line of code is overhead. We have to maintain that in the future, potential for things to go wrong. And there might be obvious risks that may not be a big deal at the end of the day, but then those subtle risks doesn't mean that they're low risk. So you could have a subtle risk that's really high risk but difficult to spot. And by practicing, you'll be able to find those risks better. And then this is something I think as a team you can do as well, where you're discussing and identifying risks and then classifying those as acceptable or not. Because you don't have to remove the risk from everything, but you do really want to identify risks so that you know and you have the full context to understand is this appropriate. And as you do this, one of the things that you might get good at is identifying one-way doors. And so, when I was at SalesOff, we were doing software architecture stuff, right? Sort of buzzwordy, and we were like, what, what do we do? Like, what is a software architect? And really, the definition that we came to that I liked is we identify things that are gonna be difficult to change later, and we try our best to get them right the first time, because it's gonna be painful when we have to change them in the future. And so if something's gonna be, you know, a pain or just really difficult or even impossible. I think most things aren't impossible to change, but if it's gonna be pretty hard, you wanna identify that early. And you can either accept that as a risk and just be like, oh, I hope it works, because if it doesn't, it's, it's not gonna be fun for us in the future. Or you can reevaluate the problem and say, hey, do we need to approach this a different way? Do we need to change some requirements or basically reestablish that context so we can change the level of risk that we're gonna take with this? And I saw this term several years ago now. It was actually called innovation tokens. And as I went to start a company after being in corporate world, I really thought about that. And basically, you want to take on risk, but you need to have a budget for it. And so I effectively called them risk tokens, where I was like, I give myself three risk tokens that are high-level systemic things that I know are risky, but by doing them, I'm planning on giving myself an advantage that I wouldn't have otherwise. So as much as I hate to say this, you know, Elixir might be one of those risk tokens for people. When, they start it, when they're starting a project, maybe you have one person who's, who knows Elixir and wants to bring it to the rest of the team who doesn't know it. In that context, Elixir would be risky. Now, if you're starting Elixir and your whole team knows it well, then you have a different context. It may just be the right decision that's not a risk at that point. Things like the database that you use, the libraries that you're using, these can all consume a risk token, and you just have to make sure that you're keeping that in check as you build your software. And maybe this is obvious, but once you have risk, it's really important that you remember that risk over time. It's very easy to forget that six months ago, this was a really large potential risk that we identified, and if nothing's happened for six months, you might just forget about it, right? And so keeping an index of risk and sharing that index and sharing that tribal knowledge with new teammates so that they also have the context of maybe why decisions were made or um, you know, just things that are important to that business, you're gonna share that with the new teammates. And trying to remove risk over time. And removing risk doesn't always mean changing code or changing the approach. It could be that your assumptions have been validated because if you take an assumption into a solution, you're taking a risk that that assumption doesn't hold. So if it does hold and everything works out great, it's like, oh, hey, maybe that, that's not actually that risky. And we, we can sort of remove that from our index and just keep an eye on it, but maybe it's actually not a, not a problem. Maybe you do more robust error handling and monitoring. So you have a potentially risky section of code, 
and you sort of isolate it from the rest of the world a little bit more so that you can identify when problems pop up, and maybe that sort of removes the risk from that code. So change the color here, because sort of shifting the, shifting the talk back to the original purpose of, why, of what I wanted to talk about, which is really about software libraries, and when you're using software libraries as an engineer, doing things are a little risky. And a lot of amazing outcomes have risky beginnings. And uh, I cleared this with some people to make sure it wasn't too controversial to say, but LiveView, three years ago when LiveView didn't exist, if you said, we're going to build X, people would be like, this is why it's not gonna work. All these different reasons why it's not gonna work, right? So there's a risk when Chris and the team built LiveView they're taking on risk that something may not work, right? But they still push forward. And they did things to, minim to minimize and manage that risk. But they, it wouldn't have happened without taking on some form of risk. And it, you know, in hindsight, it worked out really well. But you wouldn't have known that three years ago before it happened. And the way that they built LiveView, which is, this is always, to me, the most fascinating part about LiveView. They took Phoenix channels, which existed well before LiveView did. And Phoenix Channels actually lets you, it has a behavior called phoenix.channel, and that's, most people just use that. You just use that and, that, and then you have Phoenix Channels, it's not really a big deal. But you can actually completely swap out that behavior. Uh, you do that with the, with the channel macro. You can completely swap out what, which module you send to it. And so that's what LiveView did. So they used the base of channels and that communication framework that was proven, which is, was not risky because they, they already de-risked that and they, they knew that would work. And then they built LiveView on top of that. And so the sort of pattern here to look for if you're going through something similar is looking for those swappable behaviors that you can customize for your needs. And that doesn't mean it's not a lot of work. I mean, if you look at LiveView, tons of work went into making that possible. Language level improvements, like even down to I think Erlang level improvements to make LiveView work, a lot of work but uh, that swappable behavior was part of the thing that let them do that. So this is a, a little bit about a, a project that, that I worked on uh, <laughs> where I needed a data layer. That was, it was not API driven. It was like there was templates and then you had to pass data into these templates. So I said, well, how do I want to define this data layer? Because I don't want to rewrite it from scratch because uh, it just sounds like a lot of work. And I was like, GraphQL would probably work really well for this. But at the same time, GraphQL is great for engineers, but a lot of those principles don't really make sense to maybe business people that might be writing a, a data layer and passing it into a template. And so I customized Absinthe a lot. I won't show the end result of it because people will cringe, but it was great for me, right? It was high risk, but in the context of what I was doing, it was great. But this is the thing that blows my mind about Absinthe. You don't have to actually read the code, that's not important. Absinthe exposes its entire inner workings in a pipeline. And most libraries would expose some hook points and you can hook into that. But literally the, the things that make Absinthe run are exposed to you and you're given public level functions to adjust that pipeline as, as you want. So you can do things like I did where you can remove the no unused variables phase or the no undefined variables phase. You can just straight up remove them from Absinthe's workings and that's totally possible. And that, that just blows my mind because <laughs> You'd be like, as a software library author, you'd be like, oh, someone could just take this and just remove something that critically makes it work, but we're okay with that. And so this pattern is uh, pipelines with swappable stages that allow you to trade out their, the library code for your own code. This is exactly how plug works. When you write a plug, you're putting that into basically the pipeline of how your request is executed and you have full control over that pipeline so that you can customize that and build your, your web framework for your needs. So the last example I want to talk about is the PAL authentication library. Authentication is one of those things where 90 to 95% of it is gonna be the same between apps. You have logins and forgot password and OAuth and all these different things. But there's usually some level of customization for a particular business. We want our invites to work a certain way. We want this to work a certain way. And just these small changes can really th you know, throw a wrench in the gears of your authentication library. And PAL embraces that and says like, 
hey, we provide this first class customization for every single endpoint that goes through the system and you can customize these to your needs. You could swap them out if you want, but we've even given you like these hook points where you know, before we process the create response of the registration controller when you create a new user, you can run some code. And maybe here, I'm, this code is redeeming an invite to make sure that that created user is put on the correct account that they should be on. And this is something you can just do in PAL because as a library author, they've made that possible to do. So this, ex this pattern is extension via predefined hooks. And you'll see this pop up once you start looking for it. You'll see it in, in small things like allowing for a function to be swapped out for another one via config. Things like that uh, appear all the time. And so if you're building a library, I wouldn't tell library authors how to do stuff because just the act of them building the library is enough and I am gracious for that. But if they're you know, considering adding some form of extension support into the library itself, and again, context is really important. There's no way to be like, hey, the best way to do this for your library is X. It really depends on what you're building and what your goals are. But if you do that, maybe your library is also going to get used for something that you didn't expect and could have a really interesting outcome. Like Phoenix Channels is sort of that way, right? Where it's like, because Phoenix Channels allowed for this customization, now Live View is able to hook into that and have this completely different purpose for what it's doing, but using it as a base. And that's really interesting. And you can apply this to really anything, big or small. So it might be something like, I have one little library that doesn't quite do what I want, and oh, hey, I can inject a function to customize the behavior of that library, and it's like three lines of code and everything's good. Or it could be some major endeavor where you're like, hey, the entire data layer of Absinthe, I want to sort of change up for my needs and make it work. But you can, you can do that uh, in both cases. And so really you want to you know, take away for this talk is keep your risk under control minimize it, manage it, but don't be afraid of it. It's okay to add some risk, it's okay to ship bad code, and really, you're the one that gets to choose that, and the context that you have as a developer, and as an engineer, you're the one that gets to, to make those choices. So, thank you, Gig City.